What day is it? <laughs> it's Christmas, sir. This is a mess. <laughs> doop, doop, doop. Doop, doop, doop. Doop, doop, Hi, I'm Michael. I'm Molly. I'm Erica. I'm Ramin. Today we're going to chat with you about some movies from 1992. And at the end, we've got a little trivia game included. So stick around for that. I was obsessed with Aladdin when I was a kid. And I also was about the age when it came out when your family is realizing things about you, such as that you need glasses, for example, which my family hadn't figured out yet, but they did get me this cassette. And one day I was standing like, you know, inches from the TV, which is totally normal and healthy for a child to do. I was watching it so religiously at that point that I could like read the script along with the movie, which is exactly what I was doing as I was watching. And I could hear my mom's voice barely. It felt very far away. And eventually, thank God, I finally turned to look at her. And she was screaming at me because the house was on fire. <laughs> By on fire, what I really mean is there were flames literally to quote exactly on the side of my face to quote clue there were flames directly next to me on the banister next to where i was standing thankfully i escaped but let it be known on this day that disney kills y'all you were so <laughs> engrossed in the movie that you didn't realize your room was on fire the house the house was on fire i, was, I wasn't even in my bedroom this was like i never knew that you had a house fire growing up i mean it, it was fine firemen got there fine yeah i was obsessed with aladdin i didn't really have many other middle eastern child like figures that would be appropriate for my childhood middle eastern figures and so aladdin was like it even though you know aladdin's actually arab not iranian and also like Lots of stereotypes in that movie. Definitely some problematic stuff in Aladdin, but it is a great movie. And it's one of those Disney movies, I think, that's held up largely by the performance of one of the lead voice actors, in this case, obviously, Robin Williams. Of the quotes people remember from that movie, if it's not a song lyric, it's usually something Robin Williams said. Here's a question. Is Jasmine the only Disney princess that wears pants? This is the last Ashman and Mankin mm -hmm. collaboration before uh -huh. Ashman died. Ashman did not finish all of the lyrics for this. Tim Rice came in and finished the ones that Ashman could not. And yeah, of course, Robin Williams, incredible. The animators were animating to what he was improving rather than him following a script and they had so much material, they just couldn't keep up with him. Well, it's just a person whose brain just worked so fast. Robin Williams was always, it was very precise, always complete structure and sentences, full storyline every time he made up anything. Right, you need an idea for what the genie is gonna do at this moment. Here's 12. Michael Douglas and the most infamous Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone. Yeah. So Michael Douglas is in a lot of erotic thrillers, eh? Can we just zoom out the camera right now and I can cross and uncross no. my legs? No? Okay. Basic Instinct was directed by Paul Verhoeven, who directed Robocop, Total Recall, Showgirls, and Starship Troopers. And two of those, Robocop and Starship Troopers, are satire. It's sort of interesting to see what he takes seriously and what he does not. I think from everything that I can tell, Basic Instinct is taken very seriously and sort of one of the themes of the film is bisexuality is evil apparently, especially when it's a woman doing it because that means that she's not doing what she can for the man all the time. There are some themes in the film that are maybe not ideal. <laughs> Batman Returns was the epic sequel to the first Batman movie. Michael Keaton was playing Batman again. When they created the first of the movies in 1989, they really wanted to return to the comic book original feel of Batman. And I think that this one, this sequel, was actually a little bit more successful at that than the first one. Because you could really feel that comic book element and all of the, the art design, the set decoration, and in the actors themselves. Danny DeVito playing the Penguin, and he is kind of a walking comic book character in, in a lot of his roles. He's very good at that. 
Michelle Pfeiffer played Catwoman. She was extraordinary in that role. Michael Keaton, of course, did a great job, as always. And Christopher Walken was the very surprising bad guy. The whole story of it was elegantly done and a little scary, but also a little funny. It was right in line with what the Batman series really felt like it should be. I just remember Michelle Pfeiffer being iconic in the cat suit with the stitches. I just remember the sexual tension between her and Batman, like, through the whole movie. I don't think I knew what sexual tension was when I was like 10 or whatever, however old I was in 1992, but you felt it whether you knew <laughs> mm -hmm. what it was or not. I remember even then wa watching it in the theater, loving the transition that Michelle Pfeiffer had to make from meek little secretary to like badass epic Catwoman and the way she's like sewing her own costume and oh, just yeah. the detail That's that Michelle so Pfeiffer put into that was incredible. And Danny DeVito is just doesn't get enough credit for how well he played the Penguin. Yeah, I really enjoy this Batman movie. Of the pre-Christian Bale Batman era, this might be my favorite. I think it does something that very few of the other Batman movies successfully do, including the Christian Bale ones, which is kind of marry the campy past of Batman with sort of the darker like 80s and early 90s portion because this movie has dark moments and probably because of who directed it it still feels campy despite the fact that every scene has like this kind of weird black or gray glow to it but you know what I mean? Like everything in this movie feels a little bit grimy. Don't forget, this is one of the Tim Burton Batmans. It's sort of nice that it's not what most of the other Batman movies are, which is either like hard left on camp lane or hard right on dark and edgy avenue. I think we should talk a little bit more about Michelle fucking Pfeiffer. Yeah. <laughs> she did all of her own whip stunts in this. And there are videos of her whipping a mannequin head off and stuff like that. Because she learned how to do that Amazing. for this. But I also think it's interesting how in most of the Batman movies, there are two villains. And one outshines the other. Yeah. But in almost all of them, the other one still is excellent. Yeah. Danny DeVito yeah. is an excellent penguin. He's so gross <laughs> and terrifying <laughs> in this film. He scared me a lot as a kid watching this. Um, Same. He does an excellent job, but Michelle Pfeiffer, god damn. I remember being in the elementary school playground at recess with other girls like, doing girl play stuff. We would always talk about like wanting to be as beautiful as Michelle Pfeiffer. When we play the house game, it's like, I'm going to be Michelle Pfeiffer. She was such an iconic superstar beauty that eight-year-old girls were saying they wanted to be like Michelle Pfeiffer. You know, I've been trying to figure out what she's doing with her career now, and I'm not seeing a whole lot. The more we do these movie conversations and TV show conversations, and we talk about, oh, whatever happened to her, right? right? Like, the more I realize that women in Hollywood have an expiration date stamped on their forehead. Michelle Pfeiffer was like a superstar for like five years, and then they found the next it girl. Remember when you couldn't throw a rock without hitting Jennifer Lawrence? What happened to her? The plot of this movie is lol big dog nickname. <laughs> this movie is funny dog videos before d funny dog okay. videos. Something about the 90s and animal movies, like mm -hmm. Homeward Bound, this. Air Bud! <laughs> The 90s loved them some voice acted animals. Basically, they didn't talk. Yeah. It's like the old saying, like, never work with children or animals, right? And, like, the reason for that is not because they're annoying or whatever. It's because they will always upstage you every time. I remember almost nothing about this movie from the one time I saw it, but I do have a quick story about it. And that is my first year of teaching. I was so proud of myself as my kindergarten class, my first one got picked up and I told the aide who picked them up, they walked to the beat of the music of Beethoven today. And she goes, oh, I love that movie about the dog. <laughs> I love this movie, although I imagine that if I were to rewatch it, it's probably not as good as I remember it being. <laughs> it's dramatic Whitney Houston drag numbers and yeah. Kevin Costner, like, sh shooting at people and looking sexy. <laughs> it's a sort of fun 90s action summer movie. You know what? In its defense, every time I rewatch it, I'm never bored. In this time, Whitney Houston was the biggest musical star in the world, and Kevin Costner was the biggest sort of leading, or one of the biggest leading males in the world. Let us not forget, you know, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and yeah. all the other stuff, times we've talked about him. So they brought these two together. They would never be a couple in real life as their characters, and they would never be a couple in real life as, you know, who they are individually, but they were married together so well in the script that it played to both of their strengths. We got to hear Whitney Houston sing a lot, and as Ramin said, it's a good summer movie with a good plot, and it didn't have to use a lot of, like, tricks to do that. That just played to their strengths. 
Well, having Whitney Houston in a movie is a trick. <laughs> Something about Whitney Houston's music and singing at the time makes what is otherwise a very okay story with okay performances, it makes it all better. And it, it feels like a soap when you watch it, mm. I guess, because of the music. I mean, it's a romance, right? Boy and girl are in a situation together and they fall for each other. But there's also like a, a campiness to it. Somehow. Oh yeah. Well, like, like any romance. <laughs> I loved the Joss Whedon series in the late 90s. Like that was like appointment television every Tuesday night for me and one of my best friends. Like we would come go to each other's house and watch it. This was the movie that predated that that was also written by Joss Whedon. And it was almost like, you know, it almost feels like he's workshopping the concept and that gets, you know, more refined later in the Sarah Michelle Gellar TV series. Famously starring Luke Perry, this movie, yeah. who I don't I don't know him from anything else other than this movie and 90210. Yeah, this is starring and Christy Swanson as Buffy, Luke Perry, as you said, Rutger Hauer, uh, who is Roy Batty from Blade Runner, the one who gives the dews in the rain monologue that all the straight guys love, Donald Sutherland, and smaller roles, Paul Rubens, Pee Wee Herman, Herman. Hilary Swank, David Arquette, Ben Affleck, Ricky Lake, Seth Green. I think Ben Affleck, Ricky Lake, and Seth Green are not credited, but they're like mm. in, in the crowd scene or something like that. <laughs> I am of the same mind as Molly. I loved the series, but this movie is not it in many ways. Without more time to nuance and develop these story ideas and explore them in the ways that like you really could in the TV series, mm. without that, it's just kind of like, okay, schoolgirl fighting vampires. Yeah, I mean, I think you have a point. Like the TV series allows you to go deeper because you just have more time. Pick. The Cutting Edge is a figure skating rom-com. Guy was a hockey player, but is injured in some way, so he can't play hockey anymore. So he becomes a figure skater. And he's like, this is a girly sport. And then, and she's like so much better at it than he is. And she coaches him to be better. The climax is there's some really difficult lift that they've been working on the whole film. And they finally get it at the end. They become lovers also, you know, of course. This is a film that my family and I would watch whenever it was on. Extended family. Like if I was over at my aunt and uncle's house and they were channel surfing and that was on, they'd be like, oh, Topic. Everybody's watching <laughs> Topic. I just love this genre of movie. Girl has to teach the boy how to do a thing that he doesn't want to do. And they fall in love. It's silly and it's so cute and fun. <laughs> Brendan Fraser plays a caveman who's been frozen in ice since those times. Sean Astin and Polly Shore are teens who thaw him out and take him to school with them where they convince everyone that he's an Estonian exchange student. I am a huge fan of Brendan Fraser. I will see anything that he's in. This was his really big first big breakout hit. In terms of his career, this is when, oh, Brendan Fraser is the next sex symbol. And speaking of the next big thing, it was slightly elevated among above fart jokes, but it also had a lot of heart to it. They're trying to teach this frozen caveman how to be a human. I'm Zach. I'm Krista. I love Fern Gully. It seems like from everyone else's reaction, we're all in agreement on that point. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Iconic. I was four or five when this was in theaters and I went with my grandma and I just remember it getting to the scene when yes. Tim Curry is terrorizing us. And I just remember being five, sitting next to my grandma and thinking to myself, this feels inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Curry has this weird uncanny ability to make everything a little sexual, but that <laughs> sequence especially, like it feels like that sequence alone should bring the movie to PG-13. After you're done watching this video, look up Ferngully Toxic Love, which is Hexus' song. It's so good. It's so good. It's yeah. so campy, <laughs> delightful. Yeah, imagine being like, who do we need to voice this villain? I know exactly who we need to voice this villain. There could have been nobody else playing this role, honestly. What great voice acting in the movie, like all together. This was another Robin Williams, right? He was the bat. The bat. Cheech and Chong are in it. Um, I did not know that was Cheech and Chong, but yeah. now, like, I, when you said that, I'm like, I immediately know. Zach is played by Christian Slater. I know he was just a cartoon about. character, but was anyone else weirdly attracted to Zach? I need some acknowledgement here, so thank you. In conclusion, Tim Curry, how dare you make pollution sexy? <laughs> Oh, uh, you want the truth? You can't handle the truth. 
A Few Good Men is a legal drama that was written by Aaron Sorkin. I didn't know it was written by Aaron Sorkin, but his oh, name is right. very yeah. Aaron Sorkin. Directed by Rob Reiner, starring Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson, Demi Moore, Kevin Bacon, Kiefer Sutherland, and also very small roles, Cuba Gooding Jr. and Christopher Guest. I randomly downloaded it years ago on a Kindle and watched it on an airplane. And then every time I travel on an airplane, I forget that I have to like download my content because I can't access it on a stream. Oh, and there's a few good men again. So I'll like, just watch, watch that. This. It's a fantastic movie. And every time I watch it, I catch something else. All these heavy hitting actors deliver some of the best performances of their careers. Everybody from Jack Nicholson to Cuba Gooding Jr. The guy who played the main defendant, it was his first ever role. He was like a tech guy on this movie set when he auditioned and they were like, oh, we're going to put you in this role instead. There's something about a movie or any other pop culture property that you don't have to see to know the famous line from. That year and like in years afterwards, You Can't Handle the Truth was like parodied so many times. It was just everywhere. Home Alone 2 Lost in New York was directed by Christopher Columbus and written by John Hughes and it's mostly the same cast as the original film plus Tim Curry and no one else and mm -hmm. no one else of note is oh, this film. Yeah. This was the incredible sequel to the incredible 1990 Home Alone and this time he's accidentally flown to the wrong place rather than just not getting on the plane and he's lost in New York City for Christmas. Macaulay Culkin gives an incredible performance for, for his age. Again, you have the, the great comedy stylings of both of his parents, and you actually get to see them interact a lot more with each other. I honestly can't remember many of the things that make these two films different from each other, but I do enjoy both of them every time I watch them. One is in New York. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but like, I'm talking about the basic details of... The, the structure and format of the story. which One has Tim just, Curry. Yeah. <laughs> for some reason, this kid is by himself. Watch him handle it. I need to stop trying to art direct everything. You're not getting paid for that. We can have that conversation later. Directed by Penny Marshall, starring Gina Davis, Tom Hanks, Madonna, and Rosie O'Donnell in her film debut. There's no crying in baseball. We've talked about how I love baseball movies. I think this is my favorite baseball movie. It's probably mine. Um, well, because it's girls playing baseball. And so that's really fun. Also, Gina Davis being gorgeous. Stunning. Rosie O'Donnell being peak Rosie O'Donnell. Which is funny because it's the very beginning of her film career. It's like the whole subplot of the movie that is like a buddy comedy between Rosie O'Donnell and Madonna. Donna, who could have ever expected that? Their relationship, friendship dynamic throughout the whole movie is so fun. So fun. Yeah, Madonna's actually really good in this too. She's so funny. Madonna's yeah. great yeah. in this. Yeah. Kudos to Madonna for being at the height of her fame, being like, I'm going to take this secondary character. Mm -hmm. It's not what I would expect of her. Madonna of 2024 would never. Of course, Tom Hanks, who comes in not wanting to, you know, coach the women and hating it, and then comes to be like a father figure to all of them it's world war ii right like that's the whole reason that the girls are playing baseball so like there's like those like heart-wrenching scenes where like they're getting letters that like their husbands are having bad war outcomes mm -hmm. of various kinds this is one of my comfort movies and i agree with what you said about it being my favorite baseball movie Probably. i mean how many baseball movies have you seen this and at least one more <laughs> i will also say and i say this as a fan of madonna this is probably madonna's best film work you it's, might be right yeah. actually <laughs> which isn't saying a lot sadly this one i felt like she developed more of a character same thing for rosie o'donnell like we had a very strong character from her and this character that tom hanks played he's such a chameleon he's different in almost every role that he plays gina davis was of course her beautiful elegant self and that's you know she does that a lot but she did it but so also well tough and hard as nails yeah. yeah yeah i wonder how much of the performance of Madonna being so brilliant is the Penny Marshall effect. Ducks fly together. I just remember like this movie making hockey cool in America. But I think it's yes. funny to compare this against The Cutting Edge because yes. it's guy who doesn't want to do this yes. having to do this <laughs> with yeah. Emilio Estevez as the coach. Being like Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams like, oh yeah, I could have been a great player, but I never panned out. And then getting asked to coach this ragtag group of kids hockey team. We love a bunch of misfits coming together. So this movie I think was like just outside of my demographic because I was again four in 1992 
And I feel like Mighty Ducks was more like seven to nine. I saw this movie in the theater with like my dad and brother, I think. Before I was say like 15, I saw maybe four movies in the theater in my mm. life. I never really saw many movies in the theater. And so because of that, I never saw these films the year they came out. You just I, didn't have a divorced dad who had to find something to do with his <laughs> two kids on the weekend that he had them when the weather was bad. But so the, because of that, like a lot of these films, like I, I was seeing films that were much older on home video all the mm -hmm. time. What you were saying, Ramin, about not being the right age for something, like that never seemed to matter to me because I never saw it that year anyway. I would see, I would have seen it later when it was on home video. This is one of the best Christmas movies of all time. Certainly top three of the Muppet movies. It had these brilliant performances from the human actors. It was the Muppets giving some of the best performances of their lives. And I was actually surprised to see this on the list because it came out in 1992, but it, A, it feels like it's been around forever, and B, it also feels a little newer than 1992 at the same time. It's very weird. Some of the best Christmas songs and a Christmas movie ever. It's one of these things that's withstood the test of time. Most people since its creation have watched this as a kid around the holidays. I think what makes this movie great is actually Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Not to be all, the book is better, <laughs> but I have read Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And if you haven't read it, it's a quick, fun read. I totally recommend you like get it from the library this December because mm -hmm you will realize that a Muppet Christmas Carol is the most word accurate word for word holds straight from the digger. Things that you wouldn't even expect. Like when he says, and Tiny Tim, who did not die, that's in <laughs> the Dickens. Yeah. A lot of the Gonzo lines, because he's playing jo Charles Dickens, are directly from the book. That and Michael Caine's iconic performance as Scrooge. Uh, you know, and he has said in interviews, like his whole goal was to just treat it like he was at the Royal Shakespeare Theater and give his best work. There's no sense that he's breaking character or like unable to take it seriously. And because he does that, it sort of gives the audience this unspoken permission to just like exist in this universe without treating everything a Muppet does as being something funny. Although so much of what they do is hilarious, right? Which has original songs by Alan Menken in it. Starring Christian Bale, Bill Pullman, Robert Duvall, and Margaret, Max Casella. Is he Newsies? Yeah. I don't really love Newsies, but there are like two songs in it that are fantastic. I know people who really love Newsies and I've seen it. And I agree with you, especially in the sense that if Alan Menken's writing the music, it's not going to be awful. There's definitely going to be good moments in there. But something about the music didn't fit the setting and story that it seemed like they were trying to tell about this, like, gritty, you know, Pioneers America challenges with, like, these big Disney or orchestrations. It just <laughs> I think there's, like, a 1990s Newsies is my favorite movie to failed music theater major pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> Noises Off is one of the more brilliant underrated productions that I think has been out there in movies in the last couple of decades. This is a play within a play. It's about a play called Nothing On, and it's literally a movie about the production of this farce, which in itself becomes a farce. It stars Michael King, Carol Burnett, John Ritter, Christopher Reeve, Denim Elliott, and Julie Haggerty, among others, with uh, smaller cameos. This kind of cast kind of comes along once in a lifetime. You can feel the way they feed off of each other. The second act of it is largely silent because you can see it all backstage while the production is happening. They can't talk to each other. So how do they express how angry they are about who's sleeping with who and how much it's distracting from the play and what are they going to do when they get to Broadway? This was a play first before it was a movie and it's about a traveling run of a play and you see act one of this play three times once toward the beginning of its run and it's more straightforward. The second act is the first act again from somewhere in the middle of the run and Erica said it's there's almost no spoken dialogue in the second act <laughs> because it's all back you're seeing backstage yeah. and the third act is the first act again toward the end of the run and they're like tired of each other and I know a lot of theater people who love 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 the play and will go see it any chance they can get starring Whoopi Goldberg Maggie Smith who was 58 at the time 
Mm-hmm. Kathy and Jimmy, Harvey Keitel. Brilliant movie. Amazing movie. Excellent soundtrack. Whoopi Goldberg's performance is, of course, awesome and hilarious. Kathy and Jimmy, as you said, is fantastic in this. Choir singing can be fun. Whoopi Goldberg is leading a choir and nobody really knows what they're doing. They're just fine. There's a bunch of underdogs finding their way together. And part of the plot of the movie is that nobody wants to come to our old rundown church anymore. And like the nuns are singing in the choir. And Kathy, did you even sing? So like it's all like horrible right? and out of tune and awful. Suddenly the pews are filled with people who are here and contributing money into the, like there's a scene where like the offering plate is getting passed around and they're all dropping their money in. I also think it's funny how it's dramatized in the film. The kids with the plaid shirts yeah. tied around yeah. their waist, walking by like, what's that music? Sounds cool, let's right. go to church. It, like, sorry, like, that does not happen. It's, it's not like it's hip, cool music for 1992. Right. Like it's fun music, yeah. but like, it's not like the kind of music that they would have been into. The Whoopi Goldberg character, Sister Mary, Clarence, yeah. her whole thing is that she loves like 60s girl groups, right? So all the music is inspired by 60s girl groups, which if you were a teenager in 1992, rightly or wrongly, would not have been cool to you. Wayne's World, Wayne's World, party time, excellent. Starring <laughs> Mike Myers, Dana Carvey, Tia Carrere, Rob Lowe, Laura Flynn Boyle, Chris Farley, Meatloaf, and Alice Cooper are also in the film. We got backstage passes to Alice Cooper. We're not worthy. Wayne's World is ostensibly a bro movie. I have brothers. <laughs> well, I have a brother. I have seen this movie about 9,000 times. This was on repeat in our house. There was a period of time in like the late 90s, early 2000s where like my family like would have whole conversations in just Wayne's World quotations. When I say no stairway, denied. I don't even know how to talk competently about this movie. All I can do is just say things like, we broke up two months ago, get the net. So Wayne's World is a movie. It's based on a Saturday Night Live sketch, kind of in the vein of Blues Brothers, honestly. I was thinking about like how it's kind of like a 90s version of Blues Brothers almost. Mm -hmm. You have Mike Myers and Dana Carvey playing Wayne and Garth, and they have a public access TV show that they film out of their basement. The show is about being metalheads. Like they're like 90s hair metal dudes, right? It has the famous scene where they do Bohemian Rhapsody in the back of the car, which Bohemian Rhapsody was probably like 20 years old at that point. It became like a number one radio hit after yeah. that. The movie was impactful in that regard. And a lot of that hair metal was sort of starting to come back after it had been replaced by grunge. I rewatched Wayne's World not that long ago going like, oh, this is a movie that I used to love when I was a teenager. It's so funny. I'm going to put it on. And I was like, this is not funny. None of this is funny. I think that's a fairly common thing. With there, there are movies that are more fun to quote than they are to watch. Okay. If she were a president, she'd be Abraham Lincoln. I need to cut you off, Molly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so bad I could do this for hours. <laughs> All right. Next, it's time for a game. Game time. <laughs> Molly. Who won Best Actor this year? I think it was Denzel Washington from Malcolm X. It was not. That was a famous snub. Erica, who do you think? Clint Eastwood. It was not Clint Eastwood either. Ramin, who do you think it was? It's obvious. It's Al Pacino. Scent of a woman. It's... This is how Al Pacino talks. Is that how Al Pacino talks? <laughs> I don't know. But that's my guess. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah, you know what? Boom. Tango. And hoo And playing a disability. And playing a disability. <laughs> to Molly, who was the best supporting actor? Oh, gotta be Jack Nicholson, A Few Good Men with You Can't Handle the Truth. And that one line won him the best supporting actor Oscar. Nope. Erica. <laughs> I'm gonna say Gene Hackman? Yes, it was Gene Hackman. <laughs> Ramin, who won best actress of this list? Michelle Pfeiffer in Lovefield. No? To Molly. Why do I feel like the name of the movie Lorenzo's Oil stands out to me? I think it's Susan Sarandon in Lorenzo's Oil. No? Erica? <laughs> Emma Thompson, Howard's End? That's it. Ramin, Best Supporting Actress. This one in the other category, Vanessa Redgrave, Howard's End. Nope. Molly. I seem to remember hearing the phrase... Oscar-winning actress Marie, Marissa Tomei and being like, 
what on earth did she win an Oscar for? And I think it might be my cousin Vinny. That's it. And it was, yes. it was actually kind of a scandal because she was up against all these like serious films. People thought of My Cousin Vinny as like a throwaway comedy, but she actually is very good in it. Erica, what won best original song? So I remember The Bodyguard and I remember Aladdin. I think it was, I have nothing from The Bodyguard. No, Ramin. A Whole New World. That's it? Disney always wins best new song. Yeah. That's rule number one, Erica. Disney always wins best new song. I do. Yeah, but I thought it might've been Friend Like Me. I do feel kind of bad that A Whole New World won and not Friend Like Me, because Friend Like Me would have been the last Ashman one. Yeah. And A Whole New World is Tim Rice. Yeah, but A Whole New World was like the karaoke favorite yeah. of all time. Mm -hmm. However, I Have Nothing is also an excellent song. So Erica, yeah. I think you your choice. To Molly, what was the best picture that year? A Few Good Men. It was not A Few Good Men, Erica. The Crying Game. It was not The Crying Game, Ramin. Scent of a Woman. It was not Scent of a Woman. Ah, wow, what? Molly. You, uh, I guess we're Al not Pacino. getting like any kind of thing resembling a sweep here, are we? But I'm going to try for Unforgiven. Unforgiven was correct. The Oscars love to award old white dudes. Yeah. Highest grossing films. We are going to Erica first. What do you think were the highest grossing films in 1992? Well, Aladdin's got to be on there. It do gotta, do gotta be first, actually. Wow, oh, yeah. Really nice Aladdin. Ramin. Oh, it's too Muppet Christmas too. Carol. No, to Molly. Uh, oh, I think it has to be Home Alone 2. They love a sequel. That's why they make them. That was number three. Molly gets eight points to Erica. The Bodyguard. Bodyguard was number two. Erica nice. gets nine points to Ramin. I gotta catch up. Sister Act. Sister Act was number eight. Ramin gets three points mm. to Molly. I think it has to be Batman Returns, another sequel. Batman Returns was number six. Molly gets five points to Erica. A League of Their Own. A League of Their Own was not on the list Damn. to Ramin. Fern Gully. Fern Gully was not on the list. Oh, are you serious? Okay, it's my turn, and it just occurred to me, like, how many people would have wanted to see Sharon Stone's hoo-ha, so I'm gonna guess Basic Instinct. Basic Instinct was number four, while it gets seven points. Wow. Never underestimate the power of full frontal. I mean, I guess it wasn't full frontal, I guess it was just... Partial frontal. Full <laughs> under. Okay, Erica? Beethoven. Beethoven was not one of them. Erica said... Really? Year. A family movie with a big dog? That's surprising. To remain. The Mighty Ducks. Mighty Ducks was not one of them. Ramin is out in this round. So the one that I was about to guess about three times and then my eye suddenly went to a better one on the list is Last of the Mohicans. Last of the Mohicans is also not one of them. Molly's Thank first you. error. Erica. A Few Good Men. It's only one way everybody knows that one quote. And yeah. If they all saw the movie. Well, and Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise were big sellers. You bet they were. Few Good Men was number seven. Erica gets four points. Back to Molly. Sequels. Lethal Weapon 3. Lethal Weapon 3 was number five. Yeah. Molly gets they, six points. Back to Erica. Good, good call, Molly. That's the two I was That's flipping why they between. make sequels, because mm -hmm. they make a lot of money, <laughs> even if they're bad. I have no idea whether it's good or bad. I just know that sequels make money, even yeah. if they're bad. Mm -hmm. My Cousin Vinny? Though it was an Oscar winner, was not a uh, high gross. So Erica is out in this round. How much can Molly get of the rest? Gotta be Malcolm X. It does not gotta be Malcolm X. <laughs> got one more shot, Molly. Dracula. That was number nine. Ha. Two points for Molly. You, got, you get to go again. I get a million dollars if I get it right, right? Maybe. So I'm thinking about Stoner Contingent. I'm thinking about either Wayne's World or Encino Man. Let's go with Wayne's World. Saturday Night Live. It's a recognizable, it's kind of like a sequel. It's like, that's we'll it. what it is. Ah! Mm -hmm. yes. Party time, okay. excellent. So Metacritic, so this is aggregated scores by critics. I have preloaded InterVista because I could not find a lot of information about this. And from what I could tell, it did not come out in 91. Not an English language movie. Maybe, and maybe the English version came out in 91, but I couldn't find really any information about it. So- 92. Yeah, uh, sorry, it did not come out in 92. But, um, all right, so we're starting with Erica. What do you think? were the critically acclaimed films. 
this is where we get into the random ones that you put in there because they had to be on this list. I also included most of the Oscar nominees. There is like one or two that I skipped. Well, I'm going to go with A Few Good Men to start. Good guess. Was not one of the top 10 though. Oh. Ramin. That was going to be my guess too. Well, that changes the game. Last of the Mohicans. That was also not one of them. Ramin's first error. Molly. See, the thing is, critics don't just like snobby movies. They like good Mm -hmm. movies, whether they're highbrow or not. And so my guess is Aladdin. Aladdin was number five. Molly gets six points. Erica. Brother's Keeper, because it's the only documentary on the list. Brother's Keeper was number one. Ten points. Wow. Erica's back in the game, Molly. Yep. Rami. Enjoy your time up there, ladies. (laughs) (laughs) Howard's End. Howard's End is number three. Rami gets eight points. Oh, wow. You said Porco Rosso is Miyazaki. Mm -hmm. I want that one. Poco Rosso was number nine. Molly gets two points to Erica. Unforgiven. Unforgiven is number seven. Erica gets four points. Rumi. Oh, shit. It's neck and neck. I'm so unfamiliar with these movies that some of them I'm genuinely just trying to remember, like, the genre. Like, Basic Instinct was an action movie, correct? That's not my guess. I'm just... It's a movie with Sharon Stone's hoo-ha. It's, a, it's an erotic thriller. <laughs> Molly, I hate you. You're not helping. (laughs) You know what? I'm down in the depths of this scoreboard. I might as well take a risk. I'm going to go with my heart. A League of Their Own. That's going to be my next guess. But that's not it. Ah. Well, Molly, you're welcome. Malcolm X is Spike Lee. Yeah. I'm going to guess Malcolm X. I almost guessed that. (sighs) I don't know. Something's tickling me to say Batman Returns. That is not it. Next to remain. I'm going to go with my heart again, because Molly said it's about good movies, not necessarily like Oscar bait movies. Muppet Christmas Carol. Yeah, actually, that's a contender. Unfortunately not, though. Ramin is out in this Aww. round. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. Film bros love Reservoir Dogs. I pick Reservoir Dogs. That's not it, though. Oh, man. Molly's second error. Erica. This is so obtuse. Bent of a woman. Unfortunately, that's not it either. Erica is out in this round. Down to the dregs here. Ah. Oh, you know what? I'm thinking about everything Erica said about noises off, which sounds like it could just be one of those like little known but highly regarded movies. Also, like there's also like the Woody Allen thing down in the corner, which like in spite of all the horrible stuff they critics seem to love him there's also glenn gary glenn ross which i've been trying to avoid picking because i just hate the idea of it but i feel like also critics who are often men <laughs> love that shit yeah you know what glenn gary glenn ross that's not it either we are all out in this round oh tied with yeah, erica so erica and molly tied so to fill out the rest of this list number eight unfortunately was husbands and wives damn i should have gone with that one Number six was The Player. Number four was One False Move. (laughs) Number two is The Crying Game. See, if I can remember the descriptions when you told me them, I'd be like, that sounds like a movie critics would love. (laughs) Y'all need to start taking notes. I know. (laughs) Any general (laughs) observations about anything from the game or any of these movies that we're thinking about as a whole? Well, I did want to correct myself on something I said earlier. I remember A Few Good Men as being like a big box office smash, but also winning lots of awards and respect. And it actually didn't. It got nominated billions of times, but got snubbed on a lot of these. Of these big six awards, it was only up for two of them. It was up for Supporting Actor for Jack Nicholson and Best Picture, but it did not win either. I wonder if it was in some of the other big awards like Golden Globes. Maybe, yeah. (laughs) This feels more man-focused than it's been in a while. These aren't dude movies and dad movies. I was going to say, it's kind of another year of the straight white dude. Especially with Scent of a Woman and Unforgiven. But like a lot of the other winners, Howard's End, Aladdin, highest grossing Aladdin Bodyguard Home Alone. So critics are always going to be interesting 
But I do think that it makes sense that Aladdin was critically acclaimed because it's oh, a yeah. fantastic film. Well, thanks everybody so much for watching. Please give this video a like if you liked it. Please give it a pity like if you didn't like it. It won't hurt you. If you have any comments about any of these films, please leave them below. I'd love to hear more about these films that we don't know much about. Two, this side is a video that YouTube thinks you might like. Please check that out. Up there in the corner is the link to our channel. We talk about media, mostly, mostly video games and music, but we do some movies and TV as well. That should be about it. Maintain your groovy selves.